Chronic hyperventilation syndrome, it has a long history. It was first documented back in the American Civil War by an American doctor um, called De Costa, and he termed the, the, the name irritable heart. So basically what he was seeing was soldiers who were returning back from war, and they were displaying different symptoms of dizziness, paresthesia, unexplained breathlessness, etc. So due to the stress of war, he noticed that stress was having an effect on the individual and he came up with the term irritable heart. Kerr and colleagues in 1937, they came up with the term hyperventilation syndrome. Hyper has been big or over and ventilation has been breathing. In other words, breathing too much. And it was in 1938 that Soli and Shock, they discovered that the hyperventilation provocation technique could reproduce the symptoms. So if you got an individual to take maybe 20 or 30 big breaths in and out through their mouth in one to two minutes, you could often produce the symptoms that would be associated with chronic hyperventilation. Sir Thomas Lewis, he termed soldier's heart and effort syndrome, again synonymous with war, soldiers returning from the front line and exhibiting these symptoms. And furthermore, it took a long time for the soldiers to recover because once the habit is set in place, it tends to become, it's chronic, and it's very difficult to normally for it to come back by itself unless you use some protocol or some technique, just as what we were going to be looking at here. Constantine Buteyko in 1957, he termed the disease of deep breathing. So basically his research was looking at the effects that breathing too much were having on the health of the individual. And Claude Lom, cardiologist from Papert Hospital in the UK, and he devoted many years to researching the effect that overbreathing was having on the cardiovascular system and wrote a number of papers um, in support of his work. So Dr. Buteyko, um, in 1946, he commenced his medical training at the First Medical Institute of Moscow. And one of his practical assignments were sitting at sick patients' bedsides and he noticed that the sicker the patient became, the more intense and the heavier they breathed. So at the same time he had got hypertension. His blood pressure, his systolic over his diastolic was 220 over 110, so it was very high. And he thought that maybe, well, if there's a link between breathing and sickness, surely by slowing down my breathing and by quietening my breath, it may help with my hypertension. And that's what he did. And he was able to normalize his blood pressure through his breathing. So when we're talking about breathing, we are looking at dysfunctional breathing. And there is no precise definition, you know, but generally it includes any disturbance to breathing, including hyperventilation or over breathing. It also includes unexplained breathlessness, breathing pattern disorders, or irregularity of breathing. And hyperventilation is really what we're looking at here, although we do look at, of course, dysfunctional breathing patterns. Hyperventilation means basically it's breathing in excess of metabolic requirements of the body at that time. As human beings, we have to consider we survive in food, um, we survive in water, and we survive in air. And we know that, yes, we must eat a certain amount of food each day. Both the quantity and quality of food is important. We must drink a certain amount of water each day. Both the quantity and quality of water is important. We understand that, yes, we must breathe a certain quality of air, but how much should we breathe? You know, what constitutes normal breathing? And the traits of dysfunctional breathing, they're seemingly innocuous. A person that goes into a healthcare specialist breathing through their mouth or having audible breathing or having a sigh every seven or eight minutes or regularly sniffing or even taking large breaths prior to talking, yawning with big breaths or upper chest breathing or lots of visible movement. Most of those habits, they're not necessarily looked for. You know, if, if an individual goes in to a healthcare specialist, they display these traits which are dysfunctional breathing but seldom is there any attention put on it. However, this breathing has a profound impact on the human being. Um, this would be far worse than eating a processed diet and far worse than doing little physical exercise. So normal breathing volume is 
four to six litres of air per minute, and this would be documented in any medical textbook. It usually equates to 10, 12 breaths per minute, and each breath is about a half a litre of air. But when we look at the research of, for example, people with asthma or people with sleep disorder breathing and a number of other conditions, including chronic heart failure or post heart attack, breathing volume for people with asthma is between 13 to 15 litres of air per minute. With sleep apnea, 10 to 15 litres of air per minute. So given that normal breathing is between four and six litres, here's a group of people who are breathing two to three times greater than normal. So they've developed a habit of breathing too much every minute, every hour, every day. And the best way to think of this is over breathing. If you consider somebody, you know, who's overeating, they're eating too much. For a given day, they're eating far more food than what they need. Well, over breathing is the same. For a given minute, given hour, given day, the volume of air is in excess of meta metabolic requirements. And what causes dysfunctional breathing? More than likely, it's modern life. You know, the traits of modern living, including processed foods, which are acid forming and overeating will change breathing patterns. Lack of exercise increases breathing. Excessive talking. Those of you who talk for a living, you'll realize just how tired you are at the end of the day because talking too much and talking as part of our jobs, especially when we have to project voice, um, it contributes and can lead to over breathing. Stress, a big component, and I will look at that just in a little, little bit more detail shortly. There's also a belief that it's good to take big breaths. I've asked many thousands of people, I've asked them, you know, do you feel better if you take a deep breath? If you're stressed, what do you do? We take a deep breath. And I asked them, show me a deep breath. And, you know, I'm showing this huge big breath using the chest, often through the mouth. And I'm saying, no, that's not a very good thing to do because a big breath like that, all it's doing is serving to increase breathing volume. And when we look at the effects of breathing too much, you'll start to understand why. High temperatures of houses. If the temperature is too high, breathing volume increases because we revert to primitive ways of um, restoring body temperature. In other words, we pant, just like a dog. Asthma. Asthma affects probably about 10% of the Western population. And a normal characteristic of asthma is, yes, of course, we feel the airways are constricting. And in response to that, we breathe heavier. So asthma, over-breathing, which feeds into asthma, and then, of course, the asthma causes the airways to narrow. There's a feeling of suffocation, and that feeds back into over-breathing. And there is also a genetic predisposition that the children will always mirror even the breathing of the parents. And sometimes I'll see a father and I could see a son sitting together. And as soon as the father takes a big sigh, which is a trait of dysfunctional breathing, the son will do likewise. So, you know, there is a genetic, there's also a mirroring effect that's taking place. So.